Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live show for this week. We took a week off uh, unanticipated. Mara and I were traveling. We were in Los Angeles seeing a bunch of friends. It was so good to actually see people for the first time in a year and a half, uh, all vaccinated. So we did it safely. We did it responsibly. This is the first time we actually felt comfortable taking a trip like this. And I hadn't intended to go on the trip, but just kind of last minute, I decided I, I really, there's a few people, a lot of people that I wanted to see. We, we didn't get to see everybody that we wanted to, but it was a lot of fun. And I had, I had intended to do this show live from the road last week, but we hit some technical snags and just some logistical issues and weren't able to do the show. So not ideal to interrupt the flow of the show this early in its lifespan. But thank you to everybody who's stuck around and is back this week. But the good news is we got a couple of weeks worth of stuff to cover today. We're talking about John Cena. We are talking about MGM and Amazon new buddies. We're talking about Warner Brothers Discovery and that wonderful new logo uh, and, and such a creative name as well uh, for their new company. Jupiter's Legacy, which is a movie that I, or sorry, a show I should say that I didn't watch on Netflix, but that I heard so much about has been canceled. We're going to talk about how much that show reportedly cost and what else you could buy for that kind of money. So much stuff to talk about, but we also want to talk about what you want to talk about here on the show. That's one of the reasons that I do it. So if you would like to have your question asked on the show, you can see that right there down there on the screen. You can send us a super chat or a stream lab. Uh, we will answer your questions. If you do $15 or more, we'll ask your question as soon as we can get around to it while we're doing the show. Uh, $5 or more, we will ask your question on the air. We're working on a different kind of structural thing where we're going to try to do as much news as we can up at the front and then uh, questions more toward the back end of the show. But if you want to get that question in early, right away, you can go up to $15 or more, and we'll ask it uh, right when you when you put it in. So with that being said, let's talk about our first story of the day, and that is something that was a big story last week. It would have led the show if I'd been able to do it last week, and that is John Cena. John Cena, of course, is joining the Fast family. He is part of F9, which is opening, not opening here in North America for another, I think, three weeks, but was open has been open in China for two weeks. While he was doing the promotional tour, he made uh, what, especially in China, uh, is a little bit of a slip up. He was doing a promotional appearance for F9 with a Taiwanese uh, news outlet. And he said, I'll give you the exact quote, and it's not very lengthy. This is just kind of the way it goes when you're talking about something as politically tricky as this situation. Uh, Taiwan is the first country that can watch F9. That's what John Cena said. That is a bit of a problem, especially with the Chinese government, because it's a very politically tricky situation. Taiwan being recognized as its own independent country or entity versus being a part of China. It has been a political hot button issue for years. As far as the Chinese government is concerned, Taiwan is a part of China. And to say otherwise is not a good thing, at least to them. So John Cena was uh, in a, a, a little bit of hot water. You could say a lot of hot, hot water. It was an escalating situation. And so he issued uh, an apology to Weibo, which is a Chinese uh, social media kind of analogous to Twitter here uh, uh, elsewhere around the world. And uh, well, this is uh, this is uh, this is part of the uh, apology that uh, John Cena posted. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, well... 我一个错误，我必须说，现在就是很、很、很、很重要。我爱更尊重中国，更中国人。我很、很抱歉对呃我的错误，呃，对不起，对不起，我很抱歉，你必须了解呃我很爱、很尊重中国，更中国人。So uh, a couple things I want to point out. Uh, first of all, let me get back to me here. Here we go. A couple things I want to point out. Uh, number one, John Cena speaks Mandarin, something I certainly didn't know. Turns out he has took taken that on as he was starting to become a WWE superstar, which of course he is and, and continues to be. And the WWE was expanding their operations worldwide, including to China. John Cena took it upon himself to learn Mandarin, like in his own spare time, so that he could be a better, as he said, global ambassador for the WWE brand. Taking everything else out of account here, uh, that's just impressive to me. 
I mean, that shows a lot of dedication. It shows a lot of professionalism. It shows a lot of drive to succeed. Uh, and I know I certainly can't speak Mandarin, and, and, I'm, and I'm fairly certain I don't think I could learn it if I tried. So uh, that should be acknowledged, first of all, that like th this guy, he does work hard. He works very hard for the people that hire him to do work, and I think that that should be recognized uh, first and foremost. Um, he's taken a lot of heat over this especially here in the United States. A lot of people saying that it was uh, groveling. A lot of people saying that, you know, it was cowardly. Um, I don't I don't really take issue with John Cena as much in this situation. I think that John Cena was in an impossible position. Now, it, it goes on a little bit toward the universal reps, I think, or, or whomever is prepping him for these interviews. To, and maybe they did, and it was just a slip uh, to say, hey, by the way, when you're talking to Taiwan – you stay away from the whole, you know, country thing because that's going to cause some issues. But but I think the bigger question is, you know, why why are we in this situation to begin with? Why should we have to be in a situation where if a if an actor that's in your franchise makes an honest mistake, and I do believe that it is, and it was, and I don't even want to say mistake, a slip of the tongue, whatever you want to call it, there was obviously no political intent behind what he said. Is what I'm saying. I don't think that John Cena was making a political statement when he said Taiwan is the first country that can see F9. I think that John Cena has probably done 400 press interviews for for F9, probably that week, and he was a, was not very choosy with his words, and it resulted in this situation with China. To me, this is this is more of a China issue than a Cena issue, and it's something that we've been talking about. We talked about it with Chloe Zhao. And Nomadland and the fact that there were statements that she made that, that she made years ago that have now resulted in Nomadland. The, the, the release was canceled in China. The, 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 the mentions of her winning Academy Awards were scrubbed uh, by the state uh, from all Chinese news and, and, and from social media outlets. We still don't know what's going to happen with Eternals and Chloe Zhao. We are, getting, we are facing an environment in China where the government is able to exert more power and more influence because... Hollywood now needs China. They need that money because they're making these huge projects, $200 million or more projects that, that need that Chinese money. They want the money that comes from the Chinese marketplace, and they're willing to do, obviously, anything they can to get it and to keep it. Because I, 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 this, was, this was a situation where I don't think John Cena had a choice because F9 needs the Chinese market. Now, the irony is that after all of this happened, the 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 sales for F9 plummeted in China. And it was more than likely due, I, I, we covered this a little bit on charts this week. A lot of people said like, oh, the Cena thing. See, it, it tanked the Chinese box office. I'm not quite so sure because when I was covering the opening of the film a couple weeks ago on charts, I mentioned the fact that social media word of mouth and reviews weren't great. And that oftentimes in China, we see a fall Around, I think I may have even said around 85%, which is what Fast 9, I think they, they tumbled weekend over weekend, 85%. If word of mouth isn't great, you see movies take huge declines at the Chinese box office. So I, I don't know if this Taiwan issue really was something that affected the movie's box office performance, although it happened in the wake of it. Um, so the irony may be that this whole apology was issued uh, for a movie that was going to fall off quickly at the box office anyway. But this is this is the longest in a series of things that we've been seeing. Some may call it concessions. Some may call it um, whatever you want to call it, ways to appease the Chinese government. Uh, Skyfall had scenes that were edited out of the movie in order for it to be shown in China. Iron Man 3 shot scenes specifically for the movie to be shown in China, specific to Chinese audiences. Transformers Age of Extinction. It's got a fourth act that is set in China. It features Chinese celebrities and Chinese products. It features the strong central Chinese government that will fight to protect its city, citizens uh, from the army of robots. Once upon a time in Hollywood, banned in China, Quentin Tarantino actually refused to re-edit the film. Uh, allegedly, there was no official word, but it was reportedly over the depiction of uh, Bruce Lee in that film. Uh, but even things like, this was something I actually didn't realize until today. People were looking at uh, Top Gun Maverick which is another film that's coming out from Paramount Pictures. Tom Cruise is a global superstar, so obviously they want a global release for that movie. People are pointing out that Tom Cruise's jacket, uh, if you look at his original jacket 
and Top Gun. Um, he, it's got this, you know, Far East Cruise uh, a patch on the back. And you see these flags, the bottom two flags, Japan and Taiwan. The trailer uh, people found, and, and this is these are some eagle-eyed people. The trailer for Top Gun Maverick, people noticed, it is a different patch. You'll see that the, the text at the top is different, but you'll see the flags, everything at the top the same. The bottom two flags, though, Japan, Taiwan, gone. They have been replaced by different flags. And I can assure you that one of the reasons behind this change was that if Top Gun Maverick were to show the, the flag of Taiwan in their trailer and in their movie, they would have a problem with China. They would have a problem with securing a release for that film in China, and they can't afford to do that because they want the Chinese money. They want that Chinese box office because it is, last year it was the number one box office uh, movie market in the world. Now, of course, there are extenuating circumstances, but we've been talking about for a long time that China's on their way to becoming the number one box office market in the world. And now we see Hollywood studios bending over backwards in order to get that money. I think that this is a huge problem in my mind. I think this is a huge issue because it raises a lot of questions. First of all, if you are an actor who's signing on to one of these franchise movies, do you really want to potentially sign on to a project knowing that if they want to secure a Chinese release, if you say or do something that crosses the Chinese government, sometimes you know what those things are, sometimes you don't know what those things are, that you may have to potentially be in the situation that John Cena was in, where in order to save, quote unquote, the, the global gross of your movie, that you have to go out on social media and apologize for a statement. And by the way, even politically, like what if John Cena is in favor of Taiwan being independent from China? What if that's something that he believes in? It doesn't matter. Because he's got to go out there and he has to make this statement. So first of all, if you're an actor and you see these things happening and it's been gradually, I mean, this is for me, in my opinion, I think this is the biggest step having an actual A-list actor. And I think that Cena counts. Uh, he's at least an A-list personality, particularly globally, go out there to basically protect the brand because of a, a slip of the tongue. Uh, I think that that may, may affect people choosing to do these kinds of movies. But I think this is also a fracture point in Hollywood's relationship with China. And you have this increasing corporate interest. The, the, the corporate budget, the corporate corporate profits are now involved. And, and they let things slip by. Like even when you look at things like The Force Awakens and we look at the poster, the first poster for The Force Awakens, the Chinese poster and John Boyega being greatly minimized. A lot of questions around why that happened. Uh, but that's something that Disney's not going to push back on because they need that money. They need that money. Or you know what? They don't even need it. They want it. They want that money. They want the money from the Chinese market. But I think that it's pushing studios and stars to make more and more concessions in order to get it. I don't think that this is the right road that we're on. I think that studios really do have to take a hard look. And keep in mind also that the Chinese film industry, even in just the last two or three years, has grown progressively more and more insular in the fact that they are distributing and making movies in China that they would like the Chinese in a film industry to promote. So you have fewer and fewer windows for Hollywood movies to open in China anyway. If I am a major studio head, and it, it, every major studio head or head of a corporation or whatever you want to call it, I think every single one of them has to be drawing up plans for, okay, the Chinese market has traditionally for the last decade been very important to us. We need to figure out a way to not count on that because if we want to make a movie that's about something the Chinese government doesn't like or has a character that the Chinese government doesn't like or has an actor who says something that the Chinese government doesn't like, maybe we should be in a position that we can put that movie out anyway because we believe in that movie or we believe in that actor or we believe in that character and not proactively sanitize everything so as not to offend the sensibilities of the government of one particular country. I think that that's where we need to go, and we'll see if that is where we're going to go. I don't know, but this, I think, is... I know. I am Mara reminded me. I am ever the Pollyanna. I, I really do think that 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 like some Christmas Eve, all of the heads of the studios are going to have some kind of Ebenezer Scrooge Christmas Carol thing happen, and they're going to wake up and decide that they're going to stand up for artistic integrity. Uh, that's never going to happen. If anything, it's going to go the other way. But at the same time, I, I just I, I feel really strongly about this because you see different things being pushed to the background. For example, I think one of the reasons, quite frankly, 
why there has not been a major gay character in a big Disney film is because that precludes the release of that movie in a lot of countries, including China. And I think that that has held back the development. You have these background characters. Even in Cruella, there was a big thing. Like, Cruella has the first openly gay character in any Disney movie. But, I mean, but does it? I, I, I just, I just having seen the movie, I'm like, I think that you're asking audiences to make a jump to conclusions that the movie itself doesn't really have the whatever you want to call it uh, to to really double down on and to underscore. Um, I, I, I just, I feel like you have to at some point say, okay, if you don't want to allow us to do these things, then we're just going to do them and we're going to have to sacrifice that market. We're going to have to sacrifice that money. There's a time when I would like artistic integrity to trump corporate integrity, but uh, Mara is correct. That's that's pro that's probably not going to happen. So uh, I'm going to keep living living in that dream world. We have some questions. All right, you thank you. Roll, so I, didn't really want to I was on a roll. I apologize. I apologize for everybody. I was on a bit of a roll, but yes, we have some questions to ask for people that donated fifteen dollars and up. Thank you so much. Uh, Leticia Theobald says, "Can I ask two questions?" Yes. What if I just said no? Yes. First, what did you think of the Eternals look? Also, Loki coming next week. Weekly reviews. Uh, I will say, uh, to be in, in full uh, honesty, I have not watched the trailer for the Eternals yet for a couple of reasons. Number one, I try to avoid um, trailers. It's not spoilery. I know it's not spoilery. But number two, actually, the big one, and I did this also with Last Night in Soho with Edgar Wright, now that I'm going to be going back to the movies, I actually would prefer to kind of see it for the first time on uh, the big screen. So I, I I just was under the assumption that I would see it sometime this summer on the big screen and really get my first look that way because uh, I, uh, I don't know. I just kind of would prefer to see it. I was glad that I saw Last Night in Soho on the big screen because I just love the design and the look of that trailer and everything else. So I, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm sure that I will see it in the next couple of weeks because Mara and I are are heading back to the movies at a very regular pace now. We're going tomorrow to see uh, Conj The Conjuring 3, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I wasn't able to get any screeners or anything for it. But also, I don't know if this is the same thing everywhere else. They're not showing it on Thursday night here at all. Weird. No Thursday night showings, which is very weird. Maybe it's because it's an HBO Max uh, simultaneous thing and they didn't want people to get it early and th for whatever reason, we have to go tomorrow. So we're going to the early screening tomorrow, which is at noon. We have to wake up early. <laughs> we have to wake up early. Uh, we're going tomorrow at noon to see the movie. So look out because there will be a Conjuring The Devil Made Me Do It a review right here on the channel tomorrow as soon as we see the movie. Um, Loki coming next week. Weekly reviews. I don't know. You know, I did weekly for WandaVision. I did not do weekly for Captain uh, for Well, it is really Captain America and the Winter Soldier. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, my guess is, if I had to guess, probably yes. Just by the nature of the show, and I think that it's going to have a lot of impacts in different areas, and depending on how many different things, it looks like it may be a little more uh, twisty. Uh, I, you know, Falcon and the Winter Soldier was was really good, but you know, up until the last two or three episodes, I struggled with doing a weekly review. So my guess would be yes, probably weekly reviews on Loki, but I reserve the right to change my mind on that once I see the show. Josh L says Dan and Mara. When I spent time in China, I met plenty of people who did not enjoy the censorship of their government. Just because the government censors doesn't mean Chinese citizens wouldn't like it. I think art should be art. I agree, and and, and I want to make it very clear. Uh, my issue is not in this in this case with the the people of China. It is with the Chinese government because the Chinese government is the one that enforces the censorship. Is the one that sets the standards. Is the one that approves the films. It's not the Chinese people, and I'm sure that there are many many people in China who do not agree with the restrictive nature uh, of what the government enforces on movies, et cetera. Uh, so yes, I'm, I, I have no doubt there are many, many people in China who disagree with what the government is doing. Um, it's just that, you know, it, it's the, 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 I don't want to say the regime, but the government is so restrictive that it does not allow for that freedom of expression that you see in so many other places. So that, that is a very important distinction to make though, Josh. And thank you for saying that. Jimmy Carter says, uh, Xi Jinping looks like Winnie the Pooh. That's, John, some, John Oliver confirmed. that's something that I can say here on YouTube in America that you, you can't say in China. 
that would be that would be scrubbed. So I guess the show will never be picked up in China. I guess uh, oh, that is a, that was a very lucrative syndication deal that I guess will never happen. Jody Harkavy, thank you, Jody says uh, for Mara. I've been watching a lot of Israeli shows. Have you seen uh, Shtisel or Srugam? And I'm probably have butchered both of those names. I have not, but because you mentioned it, I'm very interested. I'm gonna do a Google. Mara's gonna do a Google on that. We're gonna get her a microphone too at some point and a we camera. Have a I promise. We just we're working on our right we're working on our on our on our whole setup here yes um, uh, i know we say that every week but in the long run of the show the first two months will be uh, the very beginning of the show i know it seems like it's been weeks and weeks since we said that um and Corey king says i'm fairly certain i've heard you claim robocop is a perfect movie which i agree with what other movies would you consider to be perfect as per usual our cats Lil john and batman Send their regards to Muffin and Sir Pounce. Sir Pounce is uh, cuddled up literally on Mara's legs while she's uh, looking over questions. What other movies would I consider to be perfect? Um, I think that Jaws is a perfect movie. I think that Network is a perfect movie. I think that The Apartment is a perfect movie. Schindler's List is a perfect movie. Schindler's List is a perfect movie. Um, it, it, you know, it's a very subjective thing. A lot of people would disagree with that. For me, when I say perfect movie, it just means that, you know, when I look at it, in totality, I don't really have a big thing that I can pull and say like, oh, I liked it except for this or this one little thing. But I look at it, and I'm just like, I really have no major criticism and in some cases minor criticism with that movie. movie. Mara says 1917 is a perfect movie as well. Yeah, so uh, th those are a few that I think are perfect movies. But I also want to make sure that, that, is not a, that is not a subjective standard that I'm enforcing for everyone else and demanding that you acknowledge Trust me, I know there are plenty of people who don't think RoboCop is a perfect movie. I just happen to think so. All right, let's look at our next story. We talked about John Cena in China. This was a story that we mentioned uh, two weeks ago when we were on the air that was in the rumor mill. It was in the ether, and it turns out that it actually uh, came true. We've had another mega merger or buyout or whatever you want to call it, Amazon and MGM. Amazon has purchased MGM in a deal worth nearly $8.5 billion. This has been seen as a move to bolster Amazon Prime's selection of content. That's the C word. I hate it, but you have to use it sometimes, uh, both by acquiring the extensive back library of MGM and uh, having the rights to produce uh, and develop the IP that MGM owns. Uh, Jeff Bezos, who is the head of Amazon, uh, said, excuse me, that uh, MGM bought, uh, Amazon bought MGM because, quote, of its vast, deep catalog of much-beloved intellectual property. And with the talented MGM and the talented Amazon Studios, we can reimagine and redevelop that IP for the 21st century. Mike Hopkins, who is the senior VP of Prime Video and Amazon Studios, said, quote, the real financial value behind this deal is the treasure trove of IP in the deep catalog that we plan to reimagine, there's that word again, and develop together with MGM's talented team. Now, one piece of IP, and I hate such a corporate name, one franchise that MGM and Amazon uh, and really the new Amazon leadership will not be able to touch, at least not uh, steer the ship with, is the James Bond franchise. The James Bond franchise is now 50% owned by MGM slash Amazon and Eon, which is the production company of the Broccoli family. The Broccoli family has been involved with the James Bond franchise from the very beginning, starting with uh, Cubby Broccoli, Albert Broccoli, uh, now his daughter Barbara Broccoli, uh, Michael G. Wilson, also uh, producing films with Barbara Broccoli for many, many years. They put out a statement that said, uh, simply, we are committed to continuing to make James Bond films for the worldwide theatrical audience, meaning you will not see James Bond spun off into an Amazon original series or a TV show, etc. It looks like Eon is going to keep control of James Bond uh, and will not allow it to be spun off into anything other than a movie franchise. Still, John Logan who's the screenwriter who wrote Skyfall and Spectre uh, made, and many other great films, made an open plea uh, to the new owners in a New York Times editorial. He said, quote, James Bond has survived the Cold War, Goldfinger, Jaws, Disco, and Ernst Stavro Blofeld several times, and I can only hope that the powers that be at Amazon recognize the uniqueness of what they just acquired and allow and encourage this special family business to continue unobstructed. Bond's not, quote, content. Thank you, John Logan. And he's not a mere commodity. He has been a part of our lives for decades now, from Sean Connery to George Lazenby to Roger Moore to Timothy Dalton to Pierce Brosnan. 
and now Daniel Craig. We all grew up with our version of 007, so we care deeply about him. Please let 007 drink his martinis in peace. Don't shake him. Don't stir him. And this is, if you can find it, this is a really great editorial from John Logan because he talks about the development of the Skyfall script. And he also discusses the idea that uh, because Eon runs the James Bond franchise and because really Barbara Broccoli and, and Michael Wilson are the, the people that you deal with, when it comes to bond that you did not have all of this red tape to go through. He talked about pitching the scene where Raul Silva first meets James Bond. And he said, Hey, I want to make this kind of like a seduction scene because I, I just, I think this would be really interesting and a new take for James Bond. And the fact that he just had to take it to them and there was no fight. They just said, that sounds great. And then he got to do it. Whereas if this were a bigger corporate hierarchy, it would probably go through 17 different levels of notes and executives, et cetera. And, you know, this is John Logan basically saying like, listen, you bought this thing. It's, it's been around for what? 60 years now, almost uh, just let them do what they do. Let them do what they do. Let them make the movies that they want to make. You own it. You're going to get the money. And I, and I have to agree. And I love the fact that he, he specifically said James Bond is not content. And a lot of people ask why I hate that word. Because I do. I hate using the word content. And I know that a lot of people do. And a lot of people say like, well, you better like it because you're, you're a content creator. And that's a phrase that's been put on me. To me, content is such a, a blanket term. Uh, you know, content, like people call movies content. They call TV shows content. They call web series content. They call uh, uh, Quibi content. Like things are different. They're made for different purposes. And I hate this move toward uh, obtaining a, a, a library of decades full of disparate TV shows and movies and calling them, oh, we have all this content now. People, they need loving care. They need, I'm back, I'm back on the creative artistic integrity train over corporate integrity train. And I'm going to, I'm going to ride this train like Snowpiercer into the my wintry icy grave um there are you have to treat things differently and and so i'm with john logan i hate when when you just call james bond just another piece of content because it does mean something for people it's been around my entire life there are people that are retiring this year it's been around their entire lives it means something to people it's not just another thing for you to tweak 10 percent so that you can get a 20 percent increase in your french box office you know james bond probably does fine in france anyway I, I really do think that, uh, you know, I, I hope that we have more producers like the Broccoli's, like Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson that are saying, like, you're not going to mess with our thing here because we know what we're doing. So just let us do it. Fewer and fewer times this is happening. And Amazon, I'm sure, is going to reimagine every P, including RoboCop, my, my one of my perfect movies. They now own the rights to that or will when this deal goes through. Everything's going to be reimagined and reinvented and reimagining. It's just a fancy word for we're just going to make another one. How many of them are really reimagined? Even the RoboCop remake wasn't reimagined. It was just RoboCop again, but worse. Uh, so I'm with John Logan. I'm with the John Logans of the world. And I'm pr pretty much saying, uh, let's hope that uh, cooler heads prevail and, and that uh, maybe we have more producers or, or, or even more corporations that buy these different studios that have trust in the people that make the things that they make uh, to, to let them make them and not try to reinvent the wheel. All right. I have some comments to read. All right, let's read some comments. Uh, Dagan uh, pr uh, donated. Thank you, Dagan. Hi, Dan and Mar. Just saw Quiet Place 2, getting used to being back in theaters, but it is an experience I definitely missed, and the movie was excellent. Here's a Schmodown five-pointer for you. What's the name of Millicent Simmons' character in the film? Oh, geez. See, I could you put me on the spot, because I just, in my review, I wrote, the, I wrote those down. Um, oh, my God. This is embarrassing. It's It's... It's exited out of my mind. I don't know. Do you know the name of any of their children? Even the dead one? I did until you <laughs> asked me who it was, and then I don't know now. So now I have to look it up. So the answer is no. I should know, but I don't know because I, it's uh, Regan. I knew it was with an R. Regan. Regan Marcus. Evelyn is Emily Blunt's character. Lee is... I could maybe have pulled John Krasinski's character's name. Uh, Lee, yeah. But uh, Regan or Reagan. That's her name. I had it in my notes for my review and I completely forgot. So, and your winner, not me. Uh, Jody Harkavy says, uh, now that most are fully vaccinated, would you actually consider visiting other places? Um, yeah. I mean, well, I mean we, just did. we, we, yeah, we yeah. flew to, we flew to California and, uh, you know, Mara and I, we, we, we're not, we're not, you know, skipping around footloose, fancy free. Like if we're not sure 
you know, if we're not around people that we know are vaccinated, like we will still more often than not. Uh, well, first of all, many businesses still require masks and we're happy to wear them. Uh, my guess is even though the theater chains have dropped the mask requirement, we may still at least wear one to the theater uh, for the time being. But I mean, the likelihood we could spread it being extremely right. low, but we'd rather have an abundance of caution. Right. Well, I mean, we follow the guidelines and we have from the beginning. And, you know, the Centers for Disease Control says that vaccinated people can go X places or be in certain situations without masks. And, you know, we we trust that. But at the same time, I think that we're, you know, we, we still are, are cautious. Um, uh, just, just because, um, so yeah, of course we're open to traveling to other places. I mean, obviously we do want to know what the, what the situation is in those places. Is there a spike in cases? Um, it mercifully, it, yeah, it, it, mercifully, it seems like it's very low right now. Um, most places in the U S but yeah, I mean, I think, I think with precautions, of course, we'd be comfortable traveling places because, you know, it, it seems like the vaccines are doing their work, which is great. And, and I hope they continue to do their work. Uh, ben Rayner says, would you say Back to the Future is a perfect movie? I'd say Back to the Future is a pretty perfect movie. I would. Um, I, I don't know if I would put it 100% in the perfect category, but I'd say it's pretty close. I love that movie. Uh, Linger, Linger Singor, and I apologize if I might got that wrong, says, Hi, Dan. You're the reason I started watching SJU, and I love the new channel. What do you miss the most about Screen Junkies, and what do you love the most about being on your own with Mara? Um, well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you like the new channel. Uh, what do I miss the most about Screen Junkies? I mean, the easy answer is the the crew. Uh, we actually, Mara and I got to see Joe Starr uh, and his wife, Tor, while we were in uh, California. We had lunch with them, and it was just so great to catch up with them and see them. They were our friends when we lived in Los Angeles, and I got to work with Joe every day for several years. And, and you know, Spencer, I worked with even longer. One of the people that would make me laugh without fail every day and then, you know, Danielle and Lon, who also came in and, and shared the writer's room and even just the crew of, you know, Roth and Pac-Man and Billy and Max, and Michael, who was our boss, but didn't, didn't necessarily feel like our boss, boss Ryan, uh, our, Kevin, our editor, like everybody that we worked with, Eric Goldman, who came on um, a, a little bit later, everybody that we worked with, which just was just so great. And it was just such a great environment. So I, I would say 100 percent the thing that I miss the most about Screen Junkies is working with that team because it was such a great team. And, uh, you know, we, we collectively just through throughout eight years, almost to me being there, we all went through a lot together and there was a lot of shared history. And, and so that's what I miss the most. What do I love the most about being on your own? Um, yeah, I would just, I would say probably the freedom to do what I want. So, you know, if I want to do a demon slayer review, I'll just do a demon slayer review. Um, if I want to make a, a weird video about, you know, RoboCop. I make a weird video about RoboCop. The idea that I can I can follow any idea that I want to its conclusion. I can invest as much time in that idea as I want. I can choose not to do certain things. I can say like, well, you know, I don't really want to do this video, but I will do that video. And a lot of times it means I may get few reviews, but I like the video more. Um, my goal has always been I don't want to put anything on this channel that I would I won't stand by then I, that that seems like a compromise or something like that. Not that I really did that ever at Screen Junkies, but I like that I can invest a hundred percent of my creativity in something, and that I can I can go down every road that I want to go down. And maybe sometimes it's a dead end, maybe it's not. It's a, it's that self discovery. So I would say that creative freedom and the ability to kind of do what I want um, has been a great uh, um, a great gift uh, of running this channel, but that's not to say, you know, oftentimes with screen junkies, I was also able to do what I wanted. I just get that extra degree of freedom here. Uh, Jody says, thank you, Jody. Jody says there have been rumors that Disney might buy DC. Would they be able to do so? Or is that a monopoly? And how likely do you think uh, this would happen? Um, yeah, I don't know where these rumors are coming from. I think that highly unlikely. Only because, first of all, would they be able to do so? Probably because DC is not a studio; they're, they're, they're a brand. Um, and so, if you're if if you're DC, you know, it's not like you, you know, superhero is not something that's regulated on the government marketplace. You can't, you know, you can't have a monopoly on superhero. Uh, I don't think, first of all, that Warner Brothers, uh, Discovery, or Warner Media ever. I don't think they would sell it because that's one of their major franchises, and I, I don't know why you would sell your major franchise. Um, unless you're getting a lot of money. Um, so I, I don't think it's a monopoly legally, and I don't think that you'd be able to enforce that. I guess they technically would be able to do so because they got the money, uh, but I also don't think that Disney right now is splashing out on those huge, uh, 
these huge acquisitions like a lot of places are. How likely do I think this is that would, it would happen? I think it's, in my mind, it's it's incredibly unlikely. I, I just, <coughs> master, bless you. I just don't think that, uh, I don't, I just don't think business-wise it would make much sense. Why would you invest even more? You've got Marvel and the crossover stuff doesn't really make sense to me. I don't know. I think that's extremely unlikely. Josh L says, Dan, what's your strategy for convincing someone who hates a genre to watch a film in that genre? My fiance hates horror films, but some of them are great movies that I want to enjoy with her. Also, shout out to Tucson, Arizona. Shout out to Tucson. I, well, I used to hate horror movies too, and I can tell you from experience, um, Mara got me um, really to the point where I enjoy a lot of them. Uh, really, it's it's trying to convince her that because so many of the, particularly the mainstream horror genres, the reason why I avoided most horror movies was because I felt like a lot of the genres, especially in the last five, six, seven, eight years, had gotten stale. Paranormal Activity, Saw, the ones that you see every year over and over again weren't that interesting to me. And so I, I, I feel like Mara got me onto it by saying like, well, no, but like, but watch this one, but watch Insidious, Maybe but watch Sinister. Mara, Mara, yes. Uh, I'm getting you a microphone for next week. We're going to figure this yes, out. Yes, we're going to figure it out. Uh, watch a genre blended horror movie, watch a horror comedy or um, like a drama that has horror elements. Uh, mm -hmm. Like start with a happy death day. It's a very gentle hybrid horror movie. It's funny. It has characters you like and do it with somebody that, you know, you know, like if you want to have a family member over, if it's safe, someone else who has a lot of fun, mm -hmm. you know, laughing as a group is fun. And then eventually being scared as a group is fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and you know, and also just the classics, ha Halloween is a great intro and yeah, just show her some great ones, show her some great ones first and get her hooked on the fact that like, despite the fact that they may have stuff that she doesn't like, they're still great movies and then go from there. Cause that's how Mara got me on them. Andrew Hall says, loved your Demon Slayer review. I completely agree regarding Zenitsu. Have any other anime series piqued your interest at this point? I highly recommend Mob Psycho 100 to all Demon Slayer fans. Uh, well, I mean, the one that keeps getting suggested to me, and I've had a lot of suggestions, and thank you to everyone who has suggested one, is uh, Attack on Titan. And I'd actually heard for a long time that Attack on Titan was very good. So maybe that'll be the next one. Maybe. I mean, I hear there's a new season of Demon Slayer, but that doesn't come out till fall. Uh, but uh, Attack on Titan, I think, could be the next one. Uh, hold on, one oh, we've got a new one that just came in. All right, I was about to turn over to... Someone who has a very coincidentally famous name. Robert Stack. First of all, Robert Stack, uh, you have... Unless you're doing the YouTube thing where, like, you... First of all, if you if you have adopted the name of Robert Stack, as Bane adopted the darkness, you've adopted a wonderful name. Bravo. Uh, Bravo, because Robert Stack is one of the key figures from my childhood, mainly due to Unsolved Mysteries. If your name just happens to be Robert Stack, I'm very envious of you because you just have an awesome name. Uh, evening, Mara and Dan. I hope all is well. As a music lover, I would like to know how you decided on your theme intros and outros. I wish I had a... Um, a good answer for you. But the real answer is that I had access or found access to a great library that was affordable for me as a solo YouTube uh, creator. And I, my experience honestly with honest trailers helped me out a lot because one of the things that I always did on honest trailers when I edited them was I would sit and go through the music library and pick the music. And there were some cues that we would reuse a lot um, just because they were great trailer cues, but I would try to personalize it to every single trailer. And if it was an epic trailer, find epic music. If it was an eighties trailer, find eighties music. So I'm very used to sitting and listening to 300 songs in a music library. Uh, that was what I did for the, the theme intro and outro. It's, it's part of the same song. And it was really um, listening to a piece of music and then I would download it and then try to see like, okay, does it fit the, does it fit the animation? Can I make this be 12 seconds long or however long I need? So there are actually some music edits in the intro and outro theme that are cut together different pieces of the song. So yeah, it's really not more of an interesting question than I, I sat, I listened to a bunch of tracks on a music library and then I uh, I cut them to the the, the graphics and, and I found the ones that I like. I actually quite like my music. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Oh, I'm being told and reminded to please uh, squish that like button, squish that subscribe button if you're watching. We always have fewer likes than we do viewers, and it really does help the show grow. And uh, I also like to say that you should squish things because, you know, smashing is so violent. It really is. The only thing that can be smashed and should be smashed is cancer. Yes, yeah, smash cancer and nothing else. Uh, so, yeah, squish, squish it. Squishing is fun. Uh, squish that like button. Uh, thank you for everyone that's donated. Let's go to our next story, and that involves, we were actually just talking about this in regards to DC. 
Warner Brothers or Warner Media currently, who are in the midst of a merger with Discovery. And this uh, last week, they unveiled their new logo and the name for their new company. Their new company, the merger of Warner Brothers and Discovery, will be called, drumroll please, Warner Brothers Discovery. And here's their logo. Um, okay. Well, first of all, as they were quick to point out, this is not a final logo, which is fine. Uh, it still sucks. And I don't know who let's okay. This is the first time anyone is seeing anything about your company. Uh, the name, which let's be honest, uh, does not smack of creativity. Uh, and then this logo, which looks like the opening logo to a not particularly good animated Warner brothers film on DVD circa 2007, this is not a great logo. Uh, this looks worse than the logo that's on the Blu-ray. The sorry, the DVD of Twister that I bought in 1998. Um, I understand this is not your final logo, but but it's like that thing. You never get a second chance to make a a first impression. This is your first impression. Uh, if you don't have a particularly exciting or creative name, which they don't, um, even as a draft maybe come up with a better logo than that. Because I saw some fan-made logos that were better than that. Um, the, the, the name and the logo doesn't exactly scream. This is going to be a haven for creative ideas, but, but it's just a logo. It's an initial logo. It's the first look. This deal is not going to close for another year, probably, or close to a year. Uh, I, I just think that it's kind of like you're, you're tripping on the, the threshold as you're walking through the door. You can, you can definitely recover. This is not a sign that you're going to fall flat on your face. But uh, I, I really do think that whoever approved that logo as the first look at Warner Brothers Discovery should probably be fired, but won't be because honestly, it was more than likely the CEO of the company. So there you go. You're in a mood today. I'm in a bit of a mood today. Uh, we have a, here's another, sorry, here's another, um, uh, oh, let me get the graphic back up. Here is another question we had come in from Helen Ledwith. Thank you, Helen. Art should not be contained. It is not content. The ideas expressed, emotion shared, cannot fit in a box. Good luck on your new live show. Amen, Helen. Thank you. Uh, I agree with that sentiment 100%. And, um, you know, when art meets commerce, there is always going to be that struggle. And you, you are going to honestly have to make compromises in the face of commerce. And they're not always bad compromises. Oh, anyway. a, a lot of times they're bad compromises, but they're not always bad compromises. Uh, but I, I think that there is a point that you have to draw the line. And I think we're rapidly approaching that point. So thank you, Helen. I agree with those comments. Robert Stack, again, thank you for the honest answer. I chose the name as an in-joke to avoid being found online by my work. This donation is a nod to that. Well, that's great. And I appreciate you watching the show, Madam Vice President. <laughs> try all right uh one uh, last uh one last news story before we get to your questions and that is the show jupiter's legacy i've got to be 100 percent honest i never watched the show jupiter's legacy because it looked like well this and the trailers didn't look great and the reviews weren't great and it was on netflix which means it'll be there in perpetuity so i did not actually watch jupiter's legacy but it turns out I'm going to have plenty of time to catch up on this season because it will be the last season. Jupiter's Legacy, which was part of the big Miller World acquisition that Netflix did to, to uh, make new shows with Mark Miller, uh, with the comics that he helped create, uh, will not be coming back for a season two. But this is what really blew my mind. I mean, obviously, you know, if you're Netflix and if you're Miller World, you're Mark Miller, you don't want this to be uh, the news story about your first huge collaboration. But I saw this. This was from a writer for The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, he said, uh, uh, per sources, this is Boris Kitt, who works for THR. Per sources, Jupiter's Legacy cost around $200 million, reshoots and everything included. So this is a sizable loss. You think? Uh, we know that Netflix has money to burn, but it appears that they literally have money to burn. So I decided to, to play, uh, do a little fun little intellectual act exercise. Uh, this is called uh, Jupiter's Legacy cost how much? Uh, this is a comparison to just how much Ju Jupiter's legacy costs. Reports say it's $200 million. To put that in context, that is as much as Tenet, Black Panther, Titanic, and Incredibles 2. That's less than the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but only by about $80 million. That is half as much as Avengers Endgame. Jupiter's legacy was half of ex as expensive as maybe one of the most expensive movies of all time. Jupiter's legacy costs more than Blade Runner 2049. 
It cost more than Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. It cost more than Godzilla versus Kong. Those all were less than $200 million. And if you're going to put these into Miller conversions, Jupiter's Legacy cost 6.5 kick, kick asses, <laughs> two and a half Kingsman the Secret Services, two Logans, 3.3 Wanteds, and 1.6 Fan Four Sticks, which, by the way, that is ex as how expensive Fan Four Stick was. Uh, so Jupiter's, like, that is, that is, Netflix, I mean, I know I give you a hard time, but I want you to stick around, guys. I, you, you can't you can't keep doing this, especially, and again, I, I haven't seen the show, but I've seen the pictures and I've seen trailers and whatnot. And uh, unless I'm missing something, I don't I don't know where that money went. Unless did Tom was, was Tom Cruise in the last episode of Jupiter's Legacy? I don't think he was. You're asking me a question and I understood none of the words in it. I don't I don't think that Tom Cruise or Will Smith were in Jupiter's Legacy. Um that's that's crazy. Like you can't money is money. I know it doesn't seem like it, but Netflix, money is money. At some point you've got to you you're spending actual money here. I, I was my mind was blown when I heard that that was for one season of one show that was canceled less than a month after it came out. Like that's that's the other thing. If Jupiter's Legacy was like the biggest thing in the world, then great. I guess they decided the the go big or go home thing. I guess that they decided that they were definitely going to go big. Um, that would uh, crazy. All right, Harv's donated fifteen dollars. Hello, Dan and Mara. I would also recommend Attack on Titan as the next gateway anime. The first season is a visceral thrill ride. They should contact you about a pull quote uh, with great world building. And later seasons do a fine job deepening the characters and mythology. Also, no Zenitsu's. Well, that's really the biggest selling point for me is that there are apparently no Zenitsu's in Attack on Titan. That is all of our news stories, and if you put in uh, the $15 or more, we will also read your questions uh, as soon as they come in. But let's get to everybody else that's donated, because I also want to get to your questions, and there are always great questions here as well. Jimmy Carter says, for $5, Taiwan is a country. Well, Jimmy, uh, once again, you're just further ensuring that this show will never be picked up in China. Nicholas Earl says, can't take Hollywood's claims of inclusion and equality seriously when they fail to stand up to one of the most repressive regimes on Earth. I, I mean... That's what I say when I feel it, when I say that when we when I say that we're hitting a, a point where you have to kind of put up or shut up, I would agree. Hollywood, rightfully so, especially in the last five years or so, has been very forward and upfront about standing up for people who are oppressed, standing up for people who have traditionally been pushed to the back. And yet they have such a lucrative relationship with a government that progressively, it seems like. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, the stories, particularly the stories coming out around Mulan and where they shot that film. I mean, th there are allegedly some, some pretty heinous stuff going on there. Even if, even if let's say that's not true, even if that's not true, still the, the, the tight censorship, the way that, that, the, 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 the clamping down on freedom of expression, you know, you can only turn your back on that for so long in the name of money. And I think we're reaching that point. So I, I would agree with you there. Jody Harkavy says, uh, that's what we love about you. You're very optimistic and open. I try to be optimistic and, and open, but thank you, Jody. Uh, movie Fanobi said, Dan, Mara, you're both such intelligent, fun, and giving people. Loving the content, especially all my movies. I'm glad movies are recovering so that your channel and charts can reach full potential. Uh, part one. Ooh, there's a sequel. Uh, you can put it all in one movie. You don't have to, to donate twice, but thank you. Uh, thank, uh, this is the second part of the uh, comment. Thank you for being great people, offering your time, and wishing you the best in whatever may happen. Also, you're both kick-ass Schmodown players. Love the hair, Mara. My lady has fuchsia normally. Take care, Steve. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, that is very much appreciated. By the way, you need to bounce back up. Really. I need to bounce back up. Have you done fuchsia before? I'm not fuchsia directly. However, I have um, fuchsia elements yeah. uh, to my hair at times. Yeah. Yeah, when I did a uh, mermaid hair. Uh, Aaron Brody. Wow. Thank you, Aaron. Very generous donation. Uh, love the show. You were always my favorite from Screen Junkies. Thank you. Uh, with the controversy, quote, uh, ugh, over the Sandman non-binary casting, how do you think the award shows will or should handle the inevitable push for acting nominations for non-binary individuals? That I, That is an excellent question, Aaron. And I think that we're going to see a shakeup of how awards are delineated. You've seen some award shows already move towards dropping the gender qualifiers for performances. And um, I, I think that that's, 
I think in a vacuum that that's a good step. My, my only issue with that would be that if you were to do that, I worry that it would then kind of push the, 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 the people that should be getting those nominations that are a little bit on the outside. I think that you would just get front runners if instead of best male performance and best female performance, if you just became best performance, I'm afraid in some circles, particularly uh, shows like uh, that rhyme with Schmold and Schmobes, that it would just be like, you know, five white dudes. Um, and, and then you just push everybody out that, that could get recognized. So I think if you have a, an organization that is committed to recognizing the best performances, uh, regardless of gender, regardless of age, regardless of, of uh, sexuality, et cetera, I think that that's a step in the right direction. But it is going to be something that people have to start addressing because uh, you cannot exclude or force people uh, who are uh, non-binary uh, into a category to which they don't belong. And so I think that that is something that's going to have to be addressed. I don't think that there's an easy solution. And I'm glad that, that uh, you know, I, I'm not the person that has to come up with the answer, but it is something that's going to have to be addressed and should be addressed. Uh, Jody Harkavy says, uh, you should do a commentary on Spaceballs, Robin Hood Men in Tights, or History of the World Part 1. Huge fan of Mel Brooks. Oh, a very hard one, I bet, to do a commentary on Silent Movie. Well, yeah, you'd be feeling a lot of, a lot of sp uh, empty space. Comedies, too, Mara and I have found. Comedies are kind of hard to do commentaries on because we just want to sit and listen to the jokes. We could do Spaceballs, though. We could I do Spaceballs. Yeah, we could probably or definitely Robin do Spaceballs. Yeah. One Quarter Canadian. Very, very... Uh, generous thank you all right beat poetry time. oh beat poetry time if you're joining the show for the first time uh people will send us emojis and then when mara copies the emoji the text of what the emoji is is what i see on the shared document so instead of seeing the emoji i see the text description of the emoji and it sounds like beat poetry so every week we do at least one round of emoji beat poetry and this one is from one quarter canadian so let's get into character here get ready with the snaps ready Hippo character sitting into an office chair when they both transform into a mecha chair slash hippo hero. You have to look at this one, though. Is that an actual emoji? Yes. That is a hippo sitting. Okay. It's a, it, it's a hippo sitting into an office chair that transforms into a mecha. Yeah, that is. I think we found a transformer. That, that, I think we found a transformer. You're right. That is that is exactly what happens. That is a great emoji. Thank you, One Quarter Canadian, for that. That's that's. Hippo character sitting into an office chair when they both transform into a mecha chair slash hippo hero. That's my favorite one so far. Dean donated uh, and says, Dan, what is your favorite Australian film? That's a good question. I don't, it's tough for me to delineate which Australian ones are. Filmmakers. Right. Like I'm a big fan of Baz Luhrmann. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so like my, my favorite film from an Australian filmmaker is probably Moulin Rouge, but I don't think that that would qualify as a, as a quote unquote Australian film. I think The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, does that qualify as an Australian film? See, what's going to happen if I keep throwing films out there is I'm going to accidentally confuse it with a, a film from New Zealand, and well, I definitely don't want to do that. George Miller, like, wouldn't Mad Max Fury Road? Oh, yeah, this Mad Max, but they didn't make it in Australia. No, but I mean, he is, but he's a, fil a filmmaker, though. That's true. I guess I don't know what the definition is, but I... The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert filmmakers. is an Australian film, so that counts. I don't believe that Moulin Rouge is... Okay, this says Mad Max Fury Road is a 2015 Australian post-apocalyptic oh, action well, film. That's, so that's probably it. All right, Wikipedia says that Mad Max Fury Road is an Australian film, so I'm going with Mad Max Fury Road. That's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, Nathan Box 64 says, "Not excited about Amazon buying MGM Holdings, though it's mainly due to how I feel about Amazon's poor treatment of their shipping employees." Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's. It's hard to navigate these things because especially when the people that make the art that you love are held by corporations that maybe have practices that you don't love, where do you draw the line? Where do you delineate that? And Amazon has got their fingers in so many pies now that if you don't like what they're doing, then that means you have to boycott everything or at least be, feel conflicted about everything. So that's very difficult. Mystery Me says, do you think the Amazon MGM deal will see any antitrust scrutiny considering all the criticism of Amazon by lawmakers. I think that it will probably see scrutiny. I don't think that it will be enough scrutiny. I, I, you know, it, the government wanted to stop. It was a much more hostile government, I will say, when Warner and AT&T were merging. I, I think that the government was much more hostile, particularly towards those, those particular 
companies and Jeff Bezos, et cetera. I think that you have a less hostile government right now. I think you do have some lawmakers that don't like Jeff Bezos, uh, but I think you have a much less hostile government right now. Uh, and I think that uh, it will see scrutiny, but I don't think it's likely that it would actually hold up the deal. Um, let's see. Tim, 878787 says, Hi, Dan. Glad to finally join you live. Welcome, Tim. Question. Will there be merchandise from your channel? I would definitely buy a hoodie. That is a great question that we've talked about. I think that the, the answer to that question is, and I know that it's, I know it seems like we've been doing the channel for a long time and it's been over a year, but we're trying to figure out how to do merch in a way that we can get it fulfilled. Um, the best hosting. For merch. Yes. The best because hosting. The design of merch is easy. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. It, it's more about the logistics of it and like, what can we take on board? Also, you know, if, if we weren't going to be the ones to produce and ship it, then what's a reasonable price point or who can, who can do X amount or at what volume? There's a lot of weird things. And, and right now Mara and I can't really take on doing like manufacture shipping, et cetera. So the answer is ideally, yes, we will someday have it. Um, we're trying to figure out the best way to do it. And um, in the near future, meaning in, in the next few months, I think we're going to have a better opportunity to get a, a better hold on our schedule from a day to day and a week to week basis. So eventually, yes, please squish the like button and the subscribe button. Mara has reminded me. We'd love to have you join the show. Join the channel. Uh, Charles Harkins says, is Brie Larson the first actor to have an Oscar and a billion dollar movie? And how special of a club is that to be in? That's an excellent question. Uh, the first actor to have. Well, let's see. Let's see how many billion dollar movies there are. I will say not the only one because I know that Titanic is a billion dollar movie mm -hmm. and uh, Kate Winslet also has an Oscar. So she's not the only one. Uh, also Leo Robert, one. what's that? Leo. Leo, Leo also finally has one. And then Kathy Bates is in Titanic. We have a few Oscar winners in Titanic. I know in Avengers Endgame, you've got Tilda Swinton. Um, she has an Oscar. Uh, you have uh, Robert Redford is in Avengers Endgame. He has an Oscar, albeit not for acting. Um, Force Awakens, uh, you had, uh, I think you had one or two Oscar winners in that. I'd have to think about that. Maybe not. Um, but yeah, I, I would say she's not the only, um, and, and looking at the list, I'm sure that there's like Francis McDormand is in Transformers Dark of the Moon. And, uh, I know that, uh, she has won an Oscar as well. Uh, the Dark Knight had Gary Oldman and Christian Bale. Uh, so I would say it's probably an elite club, but uh, she's not the only one. And uh, maybe I'll be able to go through and, and even with the Toy Story movies with Tom Hanks and, and the voice cast there. But it, it's it's a very special club to be in, mainly because if you're in that club, you've got a freaking Oscar and you were in a billion dollar movie. That's pretty cool. Like career, ding. Uh, Jonas Diaz says, happy Thursday from an SJU and charting with Dan viewer. If you have enough time for video games, I suggest Telltale's The Walking Dead. Maybe try at least the first season with Mara, PS4 seasons total i actually have played the first season of the walking dead and i think i started the second season it was before we met shortly before we met um i played the first season and i think i'd started the second season and, and didn't finish it but i loved season one and uh, the telltale games in general the ones that i played and i haven't played a lot i've really enjoyed so i think that's a great recommendation that i actually have tried i didn't finish it though maybe i should i love gaming and i just don't have time to do it anymore and uh, I, like I wanted to try the new Spider-Man game. I haven't done that. There's so many, even Red Dead Redemption 2. Like I was so looking forward to that game and I just haven't had time to do it even before I started the channel. I, I, I'd like to figure out a, a, a way to, to get gaming back into my life because I really, really, really did like well, it. Well, we game on separate platforms. Yeah. also a barrier. I'm a PS4. She's an Xbox. It's okay. Because I'm right. Peyton King says, I just saw P.T. Uh, Anderson's Hard Eight last night. What do you think of that film if you've seen it? And what is your favorite PTA movie? Uh, Hard Eight is actually one of the few Paul Thomas, Th Thomas Anderson movies I have not seen. And my favorite by far is There Will Be Blood, which is just one of my favorite movies, period. Might be in my top 10 all time. That's my favorite. He's made a lot of great movies, but that one's my favorite easily. Uh, Jarrett Barkley, what kind of story would you stay away from, movie or TV show? Um, I generally try to give any story a chance. Uh the only ones I actively stay away from are, are ones that I think sort of wallow in misery or wallow in uh, uh, pain or, or just have a very torturous nature to them. Things like um, Antichrist, the movie with, with Willem Dafoe. I think Lars Ventura did that one. 
Um, even like, and it's a fine line because uh, like uh, for me, the movie hereditary skirts right up to that line, but doesn't cross it as far as just being about misery and just torturous emotional and physical pain. Um, that the only thing there's some, like, I haven't seen the movie irreversible. Um, it's just, if it's got that reputation, I, it's just not something that I, enjoy i find it disturbing a lot of times i'll find it to be self-indulgent and a lot of times i'll also just kind of struggle with the motivations behind telling that kind of story i'm not saying that they're not good stories that they shouldn't be told but those are really the only kind of movies that i actively will avoid um are movies like that uh, kaylee vaughn says i'm so excited about in the heights and dear evan hansen this year what is your favorite recent mu movie musical a uh, recent movie musical I'm trying to think yeah, La La Land, La La Land, as Scott Mance would say. Uh, La La Land, but that's now what almost five years old, which is hard to believe. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, twenty it came out in twenty sixteen. Yeah, so that's almost five years old. Uh, but I really, really liked La La Land quite a bit. Um, they haven't made as many lately. Well, we saw. You know what was cute? Um, was that Anna and the Apocalypse? Yeah, I liked that one. That's a good one. It's a zombie Christmas musical. Also, like Sing Street. Sing. Oh, well, I think Sing I Street would probably. Rocket Man. Yeah, Rocket Man was good. I mean, it's a jukebox musical. Yeah. It's still musical. Sing Street would probably be my favorite. Even, maybe even more than La La Land. I think maybe it would be Sing Street recently because that's such a good movie. We just rewatched it for a commentary. Yes. Um, a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago, I should say. And uh, I still love that movie. Matt Chapman says, okay, get ready. Um, we've got two. Yeah, we have bro. two in a row, two emoji uh, beat beat. What do I call it? Beat, beat poetry, poetry in a row. Is this from Matt Chapman? Ready? Get your get your snaps ready. Lemon character taking his sunglasses off and raising his arm to greet someone, imitated by baby lemon. There's there's some scratching in the background. Uh, well, thanks to Muffin. You're right there, Muffin. You you, you, this, you keep scratching the cone as if that's going to do something. Uh, and then Robert Stack says, ready? Here we go. Oh, I like this one. Sunglasses perpetually fall onto video game controller's proud face. It's very important that the controller has a proud face. Not just a face, a proud face. Thank you both for that beat choke poetry. Stacy donated and said, I just found out Epix is leaving Amazon and going to Paramount+. Plus. So a bunch of titles are leaving Prime June 10th. With a lot of titles leaving, some notable, it seems like this should be bigger news, but no one is talking about it. Why do you think that is? Well, I think, honestly, Stacey, it's so hard to keep track because every single month, movies keep bouncing back and forth, back and forth. Muffin, are you all right over there? Movies keep bouncing back. Oh, she just left. All right. Movies keep <laughs> bouncing back and forth, and you lose movies. The movies will go from Netflix to Amazon or Hulu, or they'll just go to go uh, uh, away altogether. Um, the Harry Potter movies, I think we talked about it on this show. The Harry Potter movies keep bouncing between Peacock and HBO Max like on a month-by-month -month basis. So I think part of it is it's so hard to keep track of the comings and goings. Um, and this is something we're also going to see, and that's what makes it frustrating, is they're going to keep jumping from streaming service to streaming service, depending on who has a what contract. Even all of these MGM acquisitions, I think the Rocky franchise has uh, certain rights that are signed to different streams. Like they're on HBO Max right now. So HBO Max is going to have those rights, even though Amazon is going to technically own them. This is going to continue to be a mess, especially as more and more companies start to not license their stuff out. A lot of those pieces of you know movies and TV shows have been licensed out to different places for years, which is why Harry Potter keeps jumping around. So this is going to continue to be a mess. So honestly, Stacey, I think the reason why nobody's talked about it is it's just so hard to keep track. Uh, and then Josh L says, unless another one pops in, I believe this will be, we've got, we've got the pop up. Okay. So we'll do this. And then I think we've got, uh, I'll take the, the donation off because I think we're on our last couple questions here. Um, Josh L says, Dan, can we hear in your or Mara's words, why you have such an appeal as a movie critic? Silly question. I know for me, it's that you're analytical and honest, no facade, at least seemingly LOL. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I, it's it's it is it's a weird i don't really know how to put in my own words why people might enjoy my reviews um i i mean i can only say i do them from a place of genuine loving movies and i tr try not to walk into any movie with any preconceived notions which is why i'll like a movie like hubie halloween and you know i got a lot of flack for liking army of the dead 
Um, I, I, I don't really walk into a movie saying it's from this filmmaker or this film actor, film actor, this filmmaker or this actor. So, and I, and I've hated their last five movies. So I'm going to go in with a kind of a negative mindset here. Uh, I, I try to leave that at the door and I know it makes me seem kind of inconsistent as a reviewer. Um, maybe that appeals to some people. I don't know. I, I like to think again in my Pollyanna world that every critic's review is motivated solely by what that critic likes or doesn't like. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't like to make decisions and I don't make decisions based on what other people like or what other people might like or might not like. Um, but I, I honestly don't know. I'm very thankful that people enjoy watching my reviews and, and coming here to the channel. Um, I, you know, I, I can't explain it. It's a mystery to me, but I'm very happy that it's actually happening. So, uh, yeah, I, it, it is difficult for me to put in words, but I can only say that it's, you know, that's my philosophy and it's something that I try to bring to everything I do, everything I do, everything I say is rooted in a love for movies. And if I don't like a movie or I get angry at a movie, it's generally because I, you know, you got the chance to make a freaking movie, man. And you did that. Come on, but come on, man. One more at the bottom, then go up to the top. One more at the bottom, then go up to the top. Okay. Stacy LM. Oh, Stacy. Thank you. Um, we have some more beat poetry. Ready? Oh, I like this one. Hippo character and tactical gear. Does I messed it up. Ready? Here we go. Sorry. Take two. No art. Perfect. <laughs> Hippo character and tactical D. <laughs> is this going to be your um, your Anna Karenina? This is going to be my Anna Karenina. Here we go. Take three. Hippo character and tactical gear does tactical flanking maneuver hand gestures. See, you thought he was going to be doing actual tactical flanking. No, he's doing what I assume are like hand it gestures. Kind of like Beyonce from the. Um, oh, like this, kind of like that. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know Beyonce kids. I'm cool. All right. R. Wallace says, I think these are our last two. Love your stuff, Dan. So glad you started your channel. Happy for uh, you that theaters are back, kind of. Ever seen Bugsy Malone? Great story behind that movie. Stay tough, Mara. I'm a fellow vet on disability. Your day will come. Um, I have not seen Bugsy Malone. I should see Bugsy Malone, but I'm not. But well, I'll put it. I'll put it on the list. I'm a Captain America. Uh, and also, thank you for the shout out to Mara there. And then Jody says, "I did buy some merch. I have a new Moral Order shirt. Shirt. It's fun to confuse people who have no idea what I'm wearing. Yeah, there's definitely some some merch stuff over at the Schmodown shop. And uh, I, I very always flattered to see people wearing." You know, the the new Merle Order shirt or the goat shirt or whatever people choose to wear. That's always very flattering. I believe that one is. One item of business. Oh, we do. Okay. Yes. This is one of the most asked about things on the channel. I have. Oops, oof, upside down. Sorry. I almost lost the tooth. Uh, I have a cricket bat that I have up on the set. And everyone's always asking. Let me switch so I can see it here. Everyone's always asking, why do I have a cricket bat? Do I like cricket? The answer is I don't dislike cricket, but I don't really know much about cricket. I've, I like cricket. I've seen a couple movies about cricket. The reason I have this is that Mara gave this to me uh, uh, for Christmas. The first Christmas, I think, that we ever yes. shared together. Or Christmas slash Hanukkah. This is me when I got it. It'll focus there. It probably won't. Right it's on. not going to focus. Anyway, that's me with the bat. And this is signed by, it comes with a little certificate and a picture, I think, also of him signing the, the thing. This is signed by Simon Pegg. Uh, and this is one of my favorite things that Mara ever gave me. And so I display it all the time on the set because, first of all, I just think it's a cool thing to display. But a lot of people are confused because they're like, why do you have a cricket bat on your set? Do you like cricket? I, I Again, I don't dislike it, but it is really, and, and a cricket bat, if you don't know, it's because in, in Shaun of the Dead, his weapon in the movie is a cricket bat. And that's how he kills zombies. And so this is a cricket bat signed by Simon Pegg that Mara got me one year uh, for Hanukkah slash Christmas. And um, it's one of my favorite things. So that's why you see it all the time on the set, because I just think it looks cool. And, and it, it's a fun thing to have. I think it's a fun little unique piece of set dressing. So that that's a that's a free AMA question right there. Um, and thank you to Mara for getting me such an amazing gift. I actually got her one a, a belated uh, gift today that came in the mail it was a my neighbor totoro umbrella that uh she saw a few months ago and wanted yes and now that we live here in arkansas she can actually use it yes uh thank you thank you thank you everybody that donated thank you everybody that asked a question thank you everybody that watched uh, before you go if you don't mind please hit that like button and the subscribe button if you have not already don't hit it actually squish it because that's what we do we have fun here 
Uh, we'll be back next week. We're going to do another live show. Who knows what the news will be? It's crazy stuff happens all the time, so I'm sure you're going to find something fun. And it's always fun to see what you want to talk about. Uh, also, don't forget to stay tuned to the channel tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, there will be a review for The Conjuring. The Devil Made Me Do It. As soon as Mara and I get to the theater and get back, and then I can shoot the review and edit it, we'll have it for you as soon as possible. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Please join us next week for the live show, but also don't forget, in between now and then, we've got The Conjuring review. We also have Charts with Dan next week. We've got all my movies next week, and then we're back here next Thursday for the live show. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Stay safe out there, and take care. Bye.